Hi, everyone. Welcome GSB alumni and guests. I'm delighted to see so many of you with us tonight. My name is Chris Slow and the co-president of the Stanford GSB Asian Alumni Chapter. Along with Denise Peck, chapter co-president, Soon Yu and Ivy Chu are events co-chairs, Sabrina Yuan and Gagan Verma are event organizer and moderator, as well as Tom Albert from the GSB Alumni Relations Office for helping us set this event up. We're delighted to welcome all of you to tonight's event, Web3, Blockchains, DeFi, NFTs, and gaming. The GSB Asian Alumni Chapter's goal is to develop a global community of GSB alumni to provide mutual inspiration and support, physical leadership, and solidarity. We aim to build and leverage this network to enhance the lives of the GSB Asian community from the GSB experience and thereafter in our professional and personal journeys by working with the school and beyond. In the next 90 minutes, you will hear from entrepreneurs and investors on topics like what is DeFi? What are NFTs? How will Web3 impact gaming? Why should someone get involved with or stay away from Web3? How have recent events in the bear market and crypto impacted the industry? Plus, much, much more. The panel discussion will be followed by an audience Q&A. Virtual session is being recorded. If you have questions for the moderator or panelists, please enter it in the chat box. And during the Q&A session, we'll try to go through as many of those questions as we can. So let me start by introducing Gagan Verma. Gagan is currently a partner at a family office named DCM Capital, with whom he works on private equity transactions. Through a separate investment partnership, he is also an active investor in Web3 with a focus on DeFi. He was formerly a partner at Tailwind Capital, $750 million private equity fund. Prior to Tailwind, Goggin worked at Morgan Stanley Capital Partners and J.W. Childs Associates. He has completed over $5 billion of private equity transactions in a variety of industries over a 30-year investing career. And he has also completed numerous types of transactions, including growth equity investments, recaps, leverage buyouts, and venture capital. Gagan received a BS from Columbia University School of Engineering and Applied Science and the BA from Columbia University, Columbia College, and also an MBA from Stanford University Graduate School of Business. So without further ado, Gagan, please take it away. Uh, thanks, Chris. And I think there's still people in the waiting room. So if you could admit them while uh, I'm speaking. Uh, thanks, Chris. And thanks to everyone on the committee who set up this event and all the members in the audience who are participating by Zoom. I'm delighted to welcome our panel uh, today. I will give you a brief background on Alan, David, and Yida, uh, but their bios understate the depth of experience they have as investors, entrepreneurs, and operating executives in Web3. Before we begin, a few housekeeping reminders. We will be speaking about the landscape of Web3. This panel discussion is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell securities or tokens. This panel discussion is not investment advice and does not constitute a recommendation with regard to any investment. Uh, let's begin. Uh, first, we have Alan Chu. Alan is CEO of Enya Labs and the founder of Boba Network, a universal layer two scaling platform for blockchains. Before Enya, Alan was a partner at XSeed Capital, where he focused on enterprise and fintech startups. He also led product management at Bycast, a private storage cloud leader that was acquired by NetApp and was one of the early software engineers at Creo, a digital prepress technology company that went public and was subsequently acquired by Kodak. In addition, Alan serves on the Stanford Graduate School of Business Alumni Board, as well as the Board of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs as co-president. Alan received a Bachelor of Science in Electrical and Computer Engineering from the University of British Columbia and an MS in Management from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Next, we have David Gann. David is a founder and general partner of OP Crypto, the parent company of OP Venture Fund and OP Fund of Funds. He founded OP Crypto, which manages over $100 million in 2021 to provide capital and hands-on operational support to early stage Web3 projects and to fund managers in emerging markets. 
Prior to establishing OP Crypto, he held senior executive roles at one of the oldest crypto exchanges, Hobi, where he led investments in global strategy. David began working in the crypto industry in 2017. He received a Bachelor of Science from Lehigh University and an MBA from China Europe International Business School. Next, we have Yida Gao, who is a Forbes 30 under 30 inductee. Uh, Yida founded Shima Capital, an early stage VC firm that invests in disruptive crypto and Web3 companies. The fund is backed by Dragonfly Capital, Digital Currency Group, Tiger Global, and other strategics, including Hobie, Bybit, OKX, Animoca, and Republic. Shima works closely with its founders to hire talent, build community and product, fundraise, and amplify their narratives. Yida formerly worked as a technology investor at NEA, a $25 billion AUM VC, and an M&A banker at Morgan Stanley. He graduated from MIT with a degree in math and computer science and attended the Stanford Graduate School of Business for his MBA. He teaches a 15492 crypto finance course every spring semester at MIT. So welcome to all three of our panels and thank you for being here. It's a very interesting time to be having this discussion with the three of you. In November, 2021, less than 12 months ago, the market cap of the global crypto industry was approximately $3 trillion. Today, it's below $1 trillion. Over $2 trillion of market cap has been lost in the last year alone. Well-respected investors and CEOs of Fortune 500 companies have referred to crypto as stupid and evil, rat poison squared, decentralized Ponzi schemes, and investment in nothing, and stupid because it's likely to go to zero. Meanwhile, the market capitalization of the largest crypto token, Bitcoin, is still $365 billion. And the market cap of the second largest, Ethereum, is $155 billion. There are well over 5,000 cryptocurrencies in the world today. There are approximately 250 who have a market cap over $100 million. With that being said, let's jump in and get the perspective of our panelists, one of whom is in the country Columbia this week and is joining us from there. <clears throat> Alan, David, and Yida, thank you for being here with us. Um, first, if you could share with us, how did you get involved with Web3 and why do you think it's an interesting area to invest in and to build companies in? Um, Yida, you just raised a large VC fund in West and Web3. Would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Gagan, uh, and the Stanford community for uh, this opportunity. Uh, thanks for the viewers for tuning in. Um, so... In terms of your question, how we how I got started, um, I uh, used to work at a, a VC fund in Sand Hill Road called NEA, New Enterprise Associates, uh, and I focused a lot of my time in uh, fintech. And part of that uh, for me was looking into what was going on in the crypto space um, in 2015, 16, 17. Couldn't quite get any deals in the in the crypto space through the partnership, uh, but that's how I kind of got started from a um, more institutional level um, before leaving um, NEA to uh, found uh, my first crypto fund, DDC. Um, and what I think is, is super exciting in, in the space now um, is that the first uh, or the, the last wave of, of crypto that uh, kind of came up um, was in 2016, 17, uh, a little bit into 18, uh, where a lot of people were focusing uh, developers were focusing uh, on on layer one, security, transactions per second, things like that, infrastructure. Um, and what's exciting now um, in this bull market, and now you know winter is that uh, you know people are more focused on more of the uh, consumer facing applications. Um, you know we take for granted now a lot of the um, infra layer things, uh, although there are are folks that are really focused on it, including Alan on our team and David, I'm sure invests a lot into the interest side of things, but I think uh, we've kind of crossed the chasm on um, crypto from being, you know, kind of something that's just generally talked about on the internet, Reddit, Twitter to, to more mainstream, thanks to a lot of things like the DeFi and NFT, uh, you know, uh, run up we've seen in the last 12, 18 months. Um, so I think that's super exciting. And, and, and why that is, is because it's um, encouraging more um, developers, more capital to flow into the space. Um, so it has more, um, you know, activity because of those, those things. And, you know, we, we um, have yet to see, you know, some of the 
large sustainable um, unicorn companies that come out of this cycle. Uh, thanks, Ida. Um, Alan, earlier this year, you raised a large amount of capital for your layer two blockchain BOVA network. Uh, would you also like to share your perspective and also uh, what is going on in Colombia this week that would require you to be down there? Thanks, Gagan. Um, what's happening in Colombia in Bogota this week is DEFCON, which is the, the world's largest gathering of Ethereum developers, with Ethereum being the largest smart contract platform, uh, blockchain platform. So it is a, it's a huge gathering and an exchange of uh, the latest ideas in how do we push the whole blockchain space forward. Um, so uh, myself and several team member, members are, are here. And we've been learning a lot and, and uh, making great connections with other project teams. How I got into to Web3, uh, I think similar to a lot of people, always starts with someone who got in first and really got uh, excited about the potential of the technology and then and I introduced you to it. So a good friend of mine was early into Bitcoin and uh, I still remember in 2015, he he's like, Alan, you got to get into it. And rather than explaining to you uh, how it works, uh, I'm going to buy you a latte. Uh, you're going to buy me a latte. I'm going to pay you back in Bitcoin. So that forced me to get a Bitcoin wallet. And and uh, that was my red pill moment of how having a visceral reaction to how amazing the technology is. Um, and I started my career as, as a, a software engineer in distributed systems. So as soon as I started digging into how blockchains work, I got fascinated by this latest um, a breakthrough innovation uh, around decentralizing an, an, infra, uh, an infrastructure that could act as not just a distributed ledger, but also a compute platform. And so several years ago, I uh, co-founded this company, Enya Labs, to, to really uh, to, to build uh, uh, on the on 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 blockchains, but back then it was a lot of the infrastructure was still very immature. So we spent a couple of years commercializing cryptographic technologies until DeFi summer happened in 2020, and uh, saw that Ethereum became very congested, gas fees became became very high, which prevented a lot of new users from joining Ethereum. And that's when we decided to jump into the blockchain scaling space and uh, and founded Boba Network to scale initially just Ethereum, but, but as time went on and other alternative layer ones started getting traction, we have now become the first and only multi-chain layer two uh, scaling multiple blockchains and also the only one that connects smart contracts with the, the legacy world uh, Web2 surfaces and the enterprise space. Uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, David, you have the benefit of having worked at one of the oldest crypto exchanges in the world, Hobie, and now you're a VC. How did you get involved? Yeah, so actually in the earlier part of my career, very similar to Ida, I worked in investment banking at Morgan Stanley, and, but then I went on to do my own startup as well. So fresh off selling my startup, I was actually very much in the seat of everyone else uh, in this chat, which is uh, doing my MBA. Uh, in China. And I think as I was thinking about doing my MBA and, you know, sort of what's the step uh, afterwards is really thinking about how can I take my career forward from there. And, you know, when I think about what industry can I really get into where I have a lot of competitive advantage, where I have, I'm not fighting an uphill battle, whether it's going to healthcare or consulting or back to banking or even doing a startup, I think there are many, many people with multiple years of experience that have kind of solidified their, their place in the space. But I think for crypto and blockchain that was just really starting to take off in early 2016, um, late 2017, where I started investing in the more retail capacity you know, while I was in school. And you know, coming out of school, um, when I was interviewed for a job, that's really where I sort of um, saw the next wave of opportunity and upside for myself um, and really taking a lot of my sort of fin financial experience as, as well as my entrepreneurial experience um, in building my startup. So you know, coming into crypto where it's pretty open source, you can really learn um, pretty much anything that you can uh, just via, um, you know, looking at Twitter and, you know, looking at a lot of sort of the different white papers that was already published. So really dove in uh, more in depth in the space and got involved. Um, and when I joined Hobie, it was really, really learning and, and doing investments in crypto and for the past four years before uh, starting my fund. Uh, thanks, David. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, now, I'd like to very briefly discuss the basics of Web3. What exactly is Web3 and how does it differ from Web2? And why is there even a need for Web3? And why do Web3 enthusiasts have a gripe about Web2? What's wrong with it? 
Alan, you have been an entrepreneur angel investor in both web one and web two, I think, and now you're in web three. Uh, would you like to share your perspective? Yeah, happy to get this conversation started. I'm sure uh, Ida and David will have very interesting things to say as well. Um, now one of the things that people uh, don't like about Web2, uh, and, and we hear about it in top, top popular media all the time, is the uh, the concentration of power, the concentration of consumer data in the hands of um, just a just a few big tech companies. And that creates a lot of concerns around, around privacy and um, uh, perhaps uh, uh, unintended uh, inappropriate uses of, of personal data. And, and, and also a lot of creators that participated in, in Web2 um, ended up seeing the value of their creation accrue mostly to the big tech companies operating the platforms as opposed to the creators themselves. And these are the, the uh, just a couple of issues that, that Web3 uh, address at a more fundamental level uh, because one of the, the big differences between Web3 and Web2 is Web3 is decentralized. You don't, there's no need for a centralized, large centralized en entity to coordinate activities. And on top of that, um, the existence of token as a, co as a resource allocation and activity coordination medium allows a redistribution of the value being created by the participants of a network so that the, the creators who, to participate receive a larger share of the value being created as opposed to in, in the Web2 world where the value accrues to uh, just a handful of big tech companies. Uh, either or David, um, uh, if, if you'd like to add anything, please feel free to do so. Um, Ida, also um, Web3 often uses its own nomenclature and we hear terms such as NFTs and DeFi. What are NFTs? What is DeFi? Um, sure. So I'll take a crack at this. Um, NFTs uh, are, it stands for non-fungible tokens. Um, so most of the crypto tokens out there are fungible, right? Meaning you can, you can exchange one for another. They're identical. Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the all of the tokens you see on coinmarketcap.com are, are fungible. Um, but this, this concept of having tokens that are non-fungible um, that represent unique um, assets, digital assets, came out um, a while ago, you know, many, many, many years ago, but uh, really took off, I would say, uh, last year. Um, you know, people on this call may know of, of you know, CryptoPunks, um, which were one of the first uh, NFTs, um, but they didn't really get any uh, traction until um, uh, last year. Um, and what's cool about this is, you know, one can argue that this is a next generation of, of, uh, of art, um, digital art. Um, art is one of one, um, you know, paintings and, and the like. Um, so are uh, NFTs. And, and, and the other, I think, more interesting part of uh, NFT, now I'll let David, or, uh, you know, take the DeFi question. Um, you know, what's interesting <laughs> For us, I think in the um, NFT space is not these, um, you know, very large market of, of NFT art uh, and profile pictures, but but more so this burgeoning um, side of NFTs, which are considered uh, functional NFTs, right? Um, how do you uh, really leverage the composability of, of, uh, of these tokens in order to do something functional with them? Uh, NFT could represent, for example, copyright of a, of a piece of music um, with its uh, you know, respective revenue streams, royalties that come from that piece of music, um, or it could represent a key that gives you access to some sort of community on, uh, online or, or in person, um, or an NFT could represent some sort of deed um, to a, a title uh, to, a, to a home. Um, that can be transferred uh, instantly as quickly as you can send an email. Um, so I think that's the more powerful, um, you know, aspect of this type of technology is that you can now uh, compose uh, value <clears throat> uh, digitally um, through an NFT and be able to um, kind of fractionalize that if you want, uh, uh, kind of access it and collateralize it and maybe um, you know, collect it together and, and create a basket of valuable <clears throat> NFTs um, that represent more than just a, a profile picture or a piece of art. Um, I think that's the next kind of 
generation or what's around the corner when it comes to NFTs. Um, and, and I think that's what uh, gets a lot of investors excited about the power of, of uh, NFTs. Uh, thanks, Ida. Um, uh, David, it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on DeFi. Is what is DeFi? And then also for Web3 gaming, how does it differ from just regular gaming and what's the impact it's having? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess I'll touch base on the gaming um, side of things first. Is you know prior to sort of starting off my career in finance and entrepreneurship, I, I was a professional gamer playing Dota for about ten years um, growing up. So I think the biggest difference between like Web three gaming and you know gaming in general is that like I think what Alan was mentioning before is that the power users themselves really become part of the protocol or the platform, right? So when you think about you know content creators you know, gamers, streamers, or like anyone that's attributing value to a game itself, you know, really has and is able to hold the inherent value of the platform by holding tokens, which is essentially fractionalized ownership of the particular game itself. So, you know, I think that, first of all, like very much lowers a barrier to become a professional gamer. First of all, I think nowadays you don't necessarily even have to be really good at playing the game in, in particular, but you just have to uh, be able to reach an audience that really appreciate appreciate watching you play and really appreciate you know all, all that you've contributed to the game. So whether you're a Twitch streamer or you know a gamer on a particular Web three platform, as long as people appreciate what you're doing and enjoy um, watching you play, they're able to you know incentivize you by you know don donating some of their tokens to you. Or if you're contributing to the game wholeheartedly, then the game platform itself is able to give you tokens and that will incentivize you for you know, further development and economic um, upside for yourself as well. So I think it not only breaks down the barrier for you know, anyone to be more visible as a, a gamer, but also allows you um, as a gamer to have better economic value at a very earlier stage. And also well, when you think about really like the metaverse itself, right? Um, and, and how Web3 gaming will come to be, it's just like right now us talking on Zoom is not a function of like, you know, it's really like um, combining everyone's sort of thoughts together and being able to come together and discuss a topic. But, you know, my, me, myself, you guys only able to see me on like a fractionalized experience. Like it's going to be that user experience going to improve over time where it's like you, you're able to experience in a very immersive setting, being able to, you know, not only control a random character on the screen, but you can essentially act as yourself. Um, as like a ready player one type of setting in the metaverse and really be able to be in full control of, you know, what's going on. But at the same time, you know, having a lot of your accomplishments um, really follow on with you. I think all of these things that we've accomplished in our career is like showing on LinkedIn, but like, I think there's no worth to show that, you know, my sort of accolades as a gamer in the past and like, like everything that happens in gaming as an industry is very siloed within um, you know, a very small sub subsector of gamers, but not very widely distributed globally. So I think that distribution factor is also going to improve over time. And gaming is going to revolutionize like how people spend their times as well, right? I think when we think about, um, you know, games today, a lot of it is not really accessible to the emerging markets. But when you think about Web3 gaming, where it's like um, a lot of it is not only free to play, but also, you know, they get actually economic incentives where like the play to earn model where, they actually able to make a living for themselves. And that's gonna change the dynamic economies of a lot of these emerging countries where it's like, you know, their real world life is it's not a, the best of experience, right? You know, I've been to Africa uh, the past couple of months and well, spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia and Latin America, right? Their real time life is not, it's a, a small facet of, you know, um, what they do when they are able to really enjoy themselves um, in more particular in when they play games and be able to really earn an income from that really is, is a game-changing uh, economy. Thanks, David. Um, from 1995 to 1999, the heyday of the first phase of the internet, a massive amount of the economy was moving on the internet. Everything from retail to stock brokerages to marketplaces to advertising was moving on the internet. Today, we don't really see large parts of the economy moving onto the blockchain. There are some people who operate in the crypto world, but most of the world doesn't do that. For example, crypto traders use exchanges in the blockchain to trade crypto to make more money in the form of crypto. 
there's real, no real world use of that crypto exchange. So having said that, what are the real world use cases of the blockchain? Let's jump into that topic. And what do you predict will be the real world use cases for Web3 that'll touch everyday lives, not just impact crypto traders? And if Web3 were to reach the same level of adoption as Web2, if you could just speculate or imagine on what the use cases might be in the future, Alan, would you like to begin? Well, that's something we think about every day, actually, uh, building global networks, because um, we truly believe in the power of decentralization and a permissionless network that could power a new form of economic system that's much more inclusive that we're building. But that requires a much more scalable infrastructure than what we have today. And now for, for this whole Web3 uh, movement to become relevant, it has to connect with the daily lives of everyday average consumer. Right, and that that's why we actually created Boba Network as a platform to that allows co connectivity, enables connectivity between the Web three world and the Web two world and and the existing enterprise world, because the reality is that the data that that Starbucks has accumulated about you is not going to go all go on the blockchain; it's going to remain in the databases. But um, we are enabling uh, use cases where, for example. Um, they, Starbucks could offer personalized NFTs that reflect your preferences that they have figured out over time based on your, your consu uh, consuming consumption profiles. Um, in terms of DeFi, um, you know, DeFi has gotten a lot of attention, but also struggling in a high interest rate, high inflation environment right now. Um, one of the, the uh, next ways of innovation we see in DeFi is actually connecting uh, the yield uh, being generated by uh, DeFi protocols to real world assets, right? Fiat based cash flows being thrown off by commercial real estate, for example, that could be tied to on chain yields being generated by DeFi. And that requires, con again, connectivity between the real world or the fiat world and the, uh, and the Web3 crypto world. I could go on and on about, about these um, uh, real world use cases, but what I, I would point out a specific example that, that I, I always find inspiring. It's, we talk about how a lot of talented people are suffering from various kinds of biases and, and that prevent them from reaching their full potential, right? Be it uh, due to their gender, ethnicity, age, um, where they're from, the accents that they may speak a language in. But when you look across Web3, a lot of participants that are building these these new gen next generation applications, you actually don't even know who, what the real world identity is. And what that means is that takes away uh, gender biases. You don't know what their gender is, right? You don't know where they live, what, uh, what their ethnicity is, how old they are. And that means you could be a teenager in India. You don't even need to live in a large city and you can participate and help build multiple Web3 projects and get rewarded for it. And think about the, the, the kind of um, economic agency this enables, right? Being able to do something that is valuable and get rewarded, not just in uh, with a paycheck, but with the upside of that, um, of what you're building as it grows, used to be something that's reserved to engineers working in Silicon Valley. And now anyone around the world that has access to the internet can participate in this movement. So I'm excited about what we're building because we see a future where this becomes the norm. Thanks, Alan. Uh, David and Yida, any thoughts on use cases? Yeah, I think the biggest one for me is like um, the sense of ownership, right? I think ultimately when you look at anything in Web2 or even in the traditional um, eras, right? Like how do you even prove something is truly yours, right? Like the shirt I'm wearing or my glasses, right? Like if I someone takes it from me, it's really hard for me to prove that that actual asset is mine, right? I think when, you know, transactions are being done on chain, when I have my own unique wallet, I'm really able to then, um, you know, really hold to, to myself, you know, these are really the assets I own and also, you know, prove my identity as, you know, myself, but also like, the transfer of value also becomes a lot more um, fluid and seamless, right? When we, um, you know, as an immigrant coming to the U.S. Um, in, in elementary school, like 
my family couldn't send money from China to here without really um, bypassing a lot of the different KYC or the intermediary sort of banking systems. There are still many, many people in emerging countries that don't have access to banking. And it's very hard for them to really transfer ownership of one thing such as cash or like properties or like anything of value, right? I think right now the, the, the process to, to do that is just very, um, you know, it's very slow and also, you know, very hectic, right? I think going forward, like transferring something of value should be as easy as sending someone a text, right? I can, you know, I think coming out from the, uh, from the 90s to the 2000s, we were very able to very seamlessly communicate via text or email or making a phone call. And that's really like the peer-to-peer -peer messaging, right? Uh, I think with the evolution of Web3, that you're able to very easily offload any assets you own to someone else, whether it's via a DeFi product for you know different financial products, uh, or it's like different assets that you own, like properties or um, you know cars or like anything that that's of higher value that you're very very easily able to transfer to someone via a smart contract. Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm gonna piggyback off what David said. Um, I think if you just think about where our world is going, are we becoming more uh, digitally native or less? Right? Um, why is Mark Zuckerberg so uh, focus on the metaverse um, and 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 having everybody work uh, in the metaverse, live their lives in the metaverse. If that's is that if that's a world that we're moving to, um, you know, it's it, it's not going to be siloed right to one digital world or another. If it were, then you know, there's really no need for for that uh, you know tokens and, and and crypto and Web three because everything is just you know centralized. Uh, everybody's living in Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse. Um, but if you believe that there are going to be many versions of this digital world that we are moving closer to, then there needs to be a uh, a a kind of system platform that is unbiased, not censored uh, by a corporation or government. Uh, in order to do that, right, you need to have some sort of blockchain, uh, some sort of um, underlying layer that is. Um, incentivized by individuals, um, entities, individuals um, that are not, you know, colluding. Um, and, and so if that's going to be the world, and as D David mentioned, um, one of the key aspects of, of crypto is, is having the proof of ownership. Um, in a digital world, it's very um, to to prove ownership in, in, another di in a different way. Um, and in the digital world, it's very easy to make copies of, of things, right? And I think we need to have some sort of technology like crypto in order for us to move to this more digitally native world where ownership, like how we own a title to our home is going to be important um, and even more important because of how easy it is to, to, to replicate things online. You need to have a way to prove ownership. And I think, uh, using NFTs and, and using tokens is 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 the way forward. Um, so I think that's how I would think about the question. Now, of course, there are a lot of low hanging fruit use cases um, like payments as and remittance, as David mentioned, um, that just is obvious, right, to the space. Um, I'm looking at a gas station across the street. You know, their margins are five percent. Um, why are they paying uh, three percent of that five percent to Visa and Mastercard? Uh, on interchange, um, if you use stablecoin USDC, uh, use another different token, um, you know that that would be much much cheaper, especially when you have L L two solutions like uh, Boba Network that make gas thank fees you. minimal. Th thank you for sharing your perspectives. Uh, the Bitcoin white paper was introduced 13 years ago. The Ethereum white paper was introduced eight years ago. Um, as we think about the life cycle of Web3, where are we in the life cycle of Web3? And if you compare this to Web1, does it feel similar to the year 1990, 1995, 2000? Um, how, do you, how do you guys think about that as you compare this to the life cycle of Web1? Web uh, Alan, would you like to start? I, I would say uh, we probably just come off a, a high in a bear market right now. Uh, and the bull cycle that we just went through felt similar to the dot-com boom, where there are a lot of capital 
uh, being thrown at all kinds of ideas, good or not. Um, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs go to run experiments to see what, what works. Business models are still being discovered in a lot of cases. Um, in some projects, the business models are pretty straightforward, but in others, uh, that might not be so. Um, so that reminds uh, that 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 feels similar to the dot com boom days, where a lot of people were wondering, well, how do these companies make money? Well, eventually, some of them figured it out, and they emerged as some of the most dominant players in the world right now. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think like just going back to my earlier point, I think like we should be very easily able to prove like who we are, right? Like be able to very easily have our assets be very interoperable, being able to send it to someone that's that needs sort of um, the help that um, they, they do in different uh, countries across the world. I think, for example, just earlier today, um, I'm trying to buy a house in Portugal and I had to go to the local sort of police office to prove that I'm not a criminal. I have to do like finger fingerprints and then send it to the Portuguese government, all of these like different things. It's very, um, there's a lot of friction, right? I think when we think about like early internet um, days where it's like, there's a ton of friction in even being able to communicate with someone um, that that's not within sort of your vicinity. Right? I think when we think about how Web3 is expanding, it's not only sort of being able to, you know, transfer value very seamlessly within each other, but also being able to very much better incentivize someone to do something, right? I think when we think about the future of work, right? Um, you know, obviously I run my own fund, Ida runs his own fund. We do a lot of other things as well, but I think um, when we think about like uh, how corporations will be designed in the future, right? There's not just gonna be someone that works at Facebook for 20 years and they're done with their career, right? Someone very much at Facebook or Meta right now has like probably five different contracting jobs that like he's, you know, writing smart contracts for like what, a three project or like, you know, he's helping to tutor like a kid um, uh, at GSP or, or there's a lot of people doing other things that with their lives that can be better and economically incentivized, right? I think when we think about how people are going to be incentivized to do things in the future, like that token structure or like that very fluid economic model will come into place where for any sort of single action that you ultimately do in the future, you know exactly where you're getting back, right? And right now it's just like, because of like different contract laws or labor laws or like different, you know, uh, sort of difficulties with regards to payment, it's very hard to um, do like side gigs or like contracting jobs. Um, but I think that's gonna be very much uh, gonna be changing with sort of evolution of like a DAO structure, which is like a decentralized autonomous organization, which. I very much believe it's going to be sort of the form and the foundations of every organization going forward and, and being able to, um, you know, attract the best talent from all over the world and whatever sort of they contribute, it's, um, they're able to really get back in a very meritocratic, meritocratic type of way. So I think in terms of web one, web two, web three, uh, every single web, you know, thing X. Uh, there's going to be a lot of, uh, if there's money involved, there's going to be a lot of um, scammers, a lot of, uh, you know, things that cause the market to look very bad. And I think that a lot of people on this call, we have 115 participants, uh, you know, there are going to be folks who think of, uh, in this crowd that think that crypto, like you mentioned, Gagan in the beginning, is, a, is rat poison and is a scam. Um, but if you just look at history, like there's been booms and busts um, uh, in every single web X. Um, and at the end of the day, right, if you believe in the technology and I think everybody on the panel believes in it, um, there's going to be unicorn companies um, sustaining over time. And um, for us, you know, our job as investors is to kind of separate the wheat from chaff um, and, and not fall into uh, this game of investing into uh, you know, pump and dump types of, uh, you know, schemes and, in, in, you know, investing in companies that are more sustainable, like, like Boba, um, that are building the foundational um, infra for applications, as I mentioned earlier, consumer facing ones to, to thrive. Um, and some of the uh, kind of KPIs, indicators that we see that make us confident in knowing that this space is going to survive um, are a couple of things. One, the amount of talent flowing into the space. Um, you know, a lot of just anecdotally friends of ours from top universities, uh, Fang are all leaving 
uh, in starting companies in the space. Um, and the reason that they're able to start companies in the space is that there's the second reason of, of why we are confident is that there's, there's capital flowing to the space. So there's support for um, all of these developers. And there's, I think as of end of last year, only 18, 19,000 active developers in, in crypto. Um, there are a lot more outside of crypto. So I think there's still a lot of, of, of growth in this space. And that's why um, there's been a lot of capital raised over the last 18 months in the space. Um, so I think those two things, developers, talent, capital, um, will, will give us, you know, gives us confidence that, you know, this space will, will uh, endure. Um, and this is this winter bear market, uh, whatever you want to call it, that we're going through right now, Bitcoin falling from 60K to 20K, um, that type of uh, activity, that cycle is, is not new. I think this is like the seventh or eighth uh, boom and bust in, the, in this market. Um, so with each one of these cycles, right, the, the price of Bitcoin inches up, uh, the number of developers inches up. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're, we're uncovering more cards to this very uh, long, long game of poker. Um, and for us, you know, we're, we're super excited for, to invest in the earliest stages of, of companies um, getting built um, today. Thanks, Ida. Um, let's now talk about recent events. Um, the Terra Luna ecosystem had a market cap of approximately $40 billion less than six months ago. Today, the market cap is less than $3 billion, including both the Luna Classic and, and new Luna tokens. Over $37 billion has been lost by investors in Luna in less than six months. Three Arrows Capital, a hedge fund with over $10 billion of assets under management, filed for bankruptcy three months ago. Celsius Networks, a crypto asset management company that raised $400 million of capital from institutional investors at a $3 billion valuation just 12 months ago, filed for bankruptcy a few months ago. So how have these recent events affected the Web3 landscape? Uh, David, would you like to begin? Yeah, sure. I think like a lot of these um, companies, when why they went under is like, I think coming back to one uh, similar theme is that they all over leverage when, you know, the market was beginning to tank, right? So I think a lot of them were long-term believers of sort of Web3, but at, at the same time, not realizing that, you know, the space itself is very cyclical. But I think at the same time, you know, when there's not the proper sort of regulations and compliance protocols in place, it creates a lot of different gray areas within where, how companies are able to operate in this space. I think uh, going forward, like as SEC is making more sort of amendments towards how they're regulating crypto and as institutions are getting more and more comfortable with the space, there'll be, better protocols put in place so that, you know, um, investors, both retail and institutional will be better protected for, you know, what's to come um, next in the space and give more comfort to a lot of the bigger sort of enterprises, conglomerates and institutional players who then come more full heartedly in the space. Um, I think that's uh, first and foremost. The second is like, um, there's a lot of lessons learned here, right? I think, uh, you know, one is, you know, really not um, over taking uh, more risks than you can really handle, right? A lot of these um, platforms, they were like, you know, really facilitating a lot of sort of the lending aspect of things, right? Terra with Anchor, Celsius is a prime brokerage and also uh, a, a sort of lend out a lot of loans to different creditors and even 3AC amongst their 3 billion AUM all of that is not actually people investing them, they actually loan pretty much the entirety of that capital, right? So a lot of it is like, they took on uh, way too much risk at hand and they didn't really have the proper, you know, processes in place to, you know, uphold that risk and, and really navigate through uh, taking on, uh, you know, so much capital at, at the same time, you know, at, at a time where they're paying out anywhere from 12% to 18% APY, on interest and that's just not sustainable over the long term, right? So I think a lot was learned uh, in all of this. You know, a lot of sort of um, money has been washed away from all of this, but at the same time, you know, a lot of this is really the higher risk uh, 
the higher risky, um, the riskier sort of uh, echelon of the, the companies that's out there, there's still a lot of really good sort of infrastructure projects that people are still really building the core infrastructure and technologies for Web3 is going for. And, and those are the ones that's gonna make longer sort of meaningful impact in this space. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, Yuda, would you like to share your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think this makes a, like what's been happening with these uh, blowups uh, makes a stronger case for why we need Web3. Um, because if everything was on chain, uh, these events probably wouldn't have happened, right? With Celsius and 3AC, all these are, yeah, they're in crypto, but they're also centralized entities, right? Giving out loans and uh, not being audited. If, if these loans were happening on chain, everything is audited. Um, granted, there are risks of smart contract hacks that have been going on hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, finance recently and, and others. Um, so that needs to be fixed, which lots of engineers, um, smart people are working on. Uh, but if these financial um, instruments and these financial trades um, are, are more done via DeFi, which we can, we can talk more about and more transparent, uh, then, then that leaves these entities managing hundreds of millions of dollars more ca accountable because everything is transparent and on chain. So I think you know these blowups um, actually make a, a stronger argument for why we need DeFi and, and uh, Web three when it comes to uh, dealing with these massive amounts of of loans and leverages um, across across the space. Um, and you know it's a big learning lesson for all the retail investors that were affected by this. Um, but I think, you know, we'll come out of it stronger. Thanks, Ida. Um, Alan, from the perspective of an entrepreneur, how have these recent developments affected entrepreneurs who are building Web3 companies? And have they affected hiring plans for Web3 entrepreneurs? Well, it certainly is a double-edged sword uh, because on, on one hand, as Ida mentioned, it actually highlights why uh, we need Web3, and one of the areas where Web3 actually uh, would do would have done better than uh, a traditional financial institution structure. Uh, but of course, with that kind of uh, magnitude of loss, it affects investor sentiment, uh, which leads to a lot of uh, project teams not being able to raise the capital they were hoping to be able to raise in order to move forward with building towards their, their, uh, their vision. And so that has in turn uh, led to uh, a... The high level of uh, talents being available on the market for for projects like ours to um, to recruit from. So that has actually benefited us because we're fortunate enough to to uh, have raised a uh, meaningful round of capital uh, just prior to the market turning south. Um, thanks for support of of uh, investors like Ida and, and David here. Um, so it it has led to a uh, a less noisy environment. Uh, consolidation of talent pools. And um, just like previous bear markets, um, builders that have the resources to build will continue to build and, and be able to aggregate more talent and emerge stronger uh, coming, coming out of it. Thanks, Alan. Alan, while we're on the topic of hiring, uh, what do you look for when deciding who to hire, say for your most critical business hire? It's actually not easy to uh, easy to find just the right profile because we're looking for, um, first of all, values and mission aligned with what we're building, like why we're doing what we do. It's not to make a quick buck, do a quick flip. We're an infrastructure play. We're building Web3 infrastructure for the long term. Uh, we aspire to become part of the, the critical fabric of, of Web3 indefinitely. Uh, so folks who join us need to have a long-term horizon. Uh, we want them to be hungry. Uh, are very adaptive, but also come with a level of maturity that that um, uh, that will allow them to go through multiple cycles of bloom and bust before we get to the point where Web three becomes the web. Thanks, Alan and uh, Ida, David. I know you're both very active in helping your portfolio companies uh, hire a talent. What do you typically look for when you're looking for key business hires for your portfolio companies? Uh, yeah, I mean, tal talent is super important. Um, that's actually the first kind of post-investment, you know, service that we, uh, brought on board for Shima, uh, because, you know, you can raise millions of dollars in this space, but there aren't millions of smart contract engineers to hire, uh, or community managers who are interested in crypto or anybody in between. So we think that talent is a, 
this big value add that we can provide to companies, especially companies that are, you know, and for us engaging, you know, very competitive bids for, for term sheets. And so that's a way for us to have an edge. Um, I think what we, what our talent team looks for, uh, for our companies and what our companies are looking for are folks that are, you know, passionate about the space, right? This is a space that is, is as much science as, as it is, you know, art and religion, uh, at least now. So you need to have a passion for it, um, be able to uh, be on uh, crypto Twitter or on Discord 24 seven. It's hard to have one foot in and one foot out of the space. Um, so um, that's something that we look for and not just a smart engineer, but somebody um, who is not looking for a nine to five job, um, but somebody who can really get, get involved but it's also, you know, like dog years, right? If you're in it 24 seven, um, you can learn a lot. And I think that's what's, what's exciting, right? Reason why we're investing in the space versus investing in traditional web two is that it's still very early. Uh, you can become an expert uh, in the space um, fairly quickly uh, versus trying to compete in, you know, consumer tech or an AI or something else. I think uh, this is a space where, um, if you're passionate about it and you really, you know, dive head first, um, you know, there's a lot of, of upside um, for, for that individual. Thanks. Yeah, for us, uh, I think we, 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 do, we take the approach a little bit differently, right? So I think instead of competing with, you know, trying to land the top software engineer or smart contract developer in the U.S., you know, I've personally spent the past 10 years in China and Southeast Asia. So what we try to do is that like, because global uh, crypto is such a global phenomenon and it's like, you know, any protocol that's uh, coming live really has to look and capture, capture the global markets right away is that we try and help them hire talent within the Asia markets that can really help them build a community there. So some of the best community managers we bring out from so that side of the market to really help them capitalize on some of those early seed users, which is very important to really build out a more application layer platform, as well as, you know, some of the developers out there, right? I think a lot of sort of the Asian developers are very much underappreciated and are at a fraction of the cost as the U.S. I think a lot of that, you know, we... Um, not only try to find sort of engineering talent, but also people that can really um, help sort of project uh, reach a wider audience and build a community from there. Thanks, David. And, and for us, I think as, as a fund, um, you know, to touch base on that, I think both Eden and I, we've been investing for the past five, six years. And for us to really be able to focus on, you know, our core competency in, you know, doing investments, um, we generally look for really, um, very smart and you know very um, responsible people to manage a back office. So I, I think for us, you know, one of our key hires right now is looking for a director of operations, someone that can handle all the sort of fund logistics, all the sort of you know audits or like dealing with legal counsel, dealing with sort of the reporting and all sort of that back office work, and so that we can really you know be heads first in looking and talking to some of the best entrepreneurs and giving them guidance on sort of um, their go to market strategies. Thanks, David. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and speak about investing in the Web3 space, especially since we have two venture capitalists on the panel and, and one uh, angel investor turned entrepreneur. Um, Ida, how does investing in Web3 companies differ from investing in other companies, uh, a SaaS company, for example? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I think slowly it's going to become, it's, it's going to converge in terms of what we look for, but um, like some key differences um, is that, uh, you know, for one, there there's a, a shorter time to liquidity, right? If you're investing in, in tokens versus equity and equity world, traditional venture, you may wait 10, 15 years before there's a liquidity event. Um, but when you're investing into a, a crypto native company uh, that has some sort of token, you know, there's a much shorter time to liquidity. Um, and as an investor, right, you you're not only thinking about, uh, you know, making an investment and then, you know, on, on liquidity event, you sell um, like a traditional what to investor would on IPO because liquidity happens so, so, so early in the life cycle of the, of the business, uh, you really have to then become like a hedge fund manager, not just a venture capital uh, manager. Um, so, uh, you know, it requires a little bit different skills skill set uh, to manage a liquid book. Um, your your e-liquid book will turn into a liquid book 
fairly quickly uh, because of these liquidity events um, when the tokens are listed on an exchange, centralized one or a DEX. Um, so that's one one big difference. Um, what we look for are, uh, you know, how network effects, right? One, um, two, because there's a token involved, how is their value accrual accrued uh, to the to the token? Um, three, we look for um, how you know this project, this company, this token will develop um, a, a strong uh, hold, hold, holding base because there's a the token that's on market. You know, you, you need to have holders of the token because crypto is very retail driven today. Those holders are going to be your community members. So um, doing some diligence on can the founding team uh, drum up enough um, kind of uh, uh, brand uh, ownership in the space, uh, narrative in the space to have those token holders uh, buy in, you know, to this religion, as I talked about earlier. Um, that's another thing we look for that, you know, you don't really underwrite in, in the Web2 world. Um, and and uh, there's a couple other things, but maybe I'll let David touch upon some of his favorite things to look at. Yeah, I think for us, it's like the investing has and will be like fundamentally changed with sort of the new token structure and um, sort of a tokenized version of ownership, right? So I think for us, um, we don't really look for equity type investments anymore. So like in taking a more contrarian view in that, like, I think equity investments will start to die out as sort of token investments will be the newer and better form of equity in that, you know, ownership is a lot more interoperable. It's able to be given out to the consumer and user base um, and also can be very much fractionalized and non-diluted, right? So when you invest in a FDV of a token project, you know exactly what percentage you're getting. And, you know, I think this very much benefits, you know, us as early stage uh, VC funds in that, you know, we don't always have to continually double down uh, on the project to um, really maintain sort of a level of ownership, right? So I think when we think about traditional forms of financing, right? You know, if you invest in pre-seed, you have to have massive amounts of capital ready to be able to even fill some of the prorata's that's coming in the future round. So that's also fairly difficult for early stage funds. For token funds, you know, not only are we able to um, invest at earlier stage and, and know exactly what we're getting uh, in the long run, but also, you know, add value via advisory or like contribute value as power users of the platform to get additional value and upside within the protocol. So all of that is like, it's incrementally better to be a Web3 investor than to be a Web2 investor in sort of the long um, tail fashion of, um, you know, investing. But I think uh, at the end of the day, right, we're investing in very, very much frontier technology. So, you know, a lot of what we see is not built yet, but uh, at the end of the day, right, I think, you know, being able to see um, really, really amazing talent coming out from all the forefronts of Fang or like a lot of the biggest, you know, even Chinese conglomerates like Tencent, you know, TikTok um, and NetEase and whatnot, you know, a lot of these sort of immersion of talent coming to the space, you know, gives great hope for, um, you know, additional sort of innovation in the space that, you know, hopefully, you know, Ida and I on the, on the forefronts of the battlefield being able to capture some of these founders uh, right um, in the early innings of them founding their companies. And I think for us, it's very much founders first. And really, for us, is you know, taking a very operational mindset um, and giving them the right tools and resources to succeed in the long run. Thanks, David. Uh, Alan, Boba Networks raised capital earlier this year. When you were raising capital, what were your considerations when picking your investor base? And for Web3 in general, what do founders care about when selecting VCs? Yeah, what we wanted to create, um, actually the exercise was more about creating a broad-based alliance around the network as opposed to fundraising. Um, a, a foundation can always sell their tokens once listed on the open market and convert them into stable coins that could then go to pay for um, engineers who build uh, the network. Um, but what's much harder to, to build is actually a community and alliance around the uh, the uh, around the network to create this ecosystem where they they are incentivized to to want the network to succeed, right? So so Boba ended up building an alliance of four hundred investors around the world, um, not just in the U.S. but in strategic markets like Korea, Japan, and many others, where um, 
as these investors have, have helped the network build local communities, find local talents, uh, make connections with local partners that, are, that have been super helpful in expanding the footprint of the network much more quickly than otherwise. Um, so definitely we're looking for not just capital, we're looking for uh, investors with specific skill sets and access to, to resources. Um, Ida mentioned, for example, how, how they've been helpful in, in, uh, in uh, talent acquisition. David has been very helpful in making introductions to uh, key partners in, in Asia. Uh, these are the types of so investors that Web3 projects actually uh, thrive on. It's not just about capital. Thanks, Alan. Um, Ida, have, have, uh, have you seen traditional VC funds uh, that have been able to adapt to investing in Web3? And I, and I asked that question because earlier on, when you told us about your background, you mentioned that at your firm or VC fund, um, they didn't get actively involved in Web3, partly because of custody issues for the tokens. So have you seen traditional VC funds uh, been able to adapt to investing in Web3? And are there examples of new VC funds that have built a native Web3 fund? Uh, yeah, if you, I think a lot of the um, venture funds on, on Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park um, have a crypto person, at least. Um, and I think it's at, at the behest of their LPs, um, especially last year, right, where the funds that um, have gone in deeper into the crypto space have done well, performed better um, from a, a, you know, kind of returns perspective. And so if you want to be competitive and raise your next round, next fund, uh, you need to have um, some exposure to the space. Now, I think some of the more timid ones are now pulling back, given uh, the pullback in the market uh, in crypto. And that's, this happens um, you know, every, every single cycle. But there's a stark difference between this cycle and the last one in 17, because Last cycle, it was still very early. Um, a lot of venture funds uh, in Silicon Valley were not dedicating a lot of time into the space, even though you know Bitcoin ramped up to almost twenty thousand um, in two thousand seventeen. I think this time around, a lot more well well respected, very old venture funds in the valley have set up separate funds for crypto, um, have hired. Um, you know, people to uh, spend time in the space and have made considerable investments this time around um, than last time. Um, I do think that they are a little bit um, uh, behind and the type of value add that uh, kind of were uh, was interesting for um, Web2 founders um, that venture funds were backing um, is not as relevant in Web3. You know, of course, there's still need for, um, you know, strategy, uh, hiring help, and there's some common denominators on just building a business. Uh, but I think the crypto native funds have a little bit of an edge when it comes to um, helping founders in Web3. I think there will be a convergence um, and, you know, the larger funds that are, you know, diving deeper into the space, like HCCNZ, Sequoia, will will you know will do well uh, but I think right now it's a time for newer funds um like like David's and, and and mine to you know take some market share and and, and really um kind of cement some uh you know uh cement cement some branding in in the space uh because of this head start that we have and because of the uh, differentiated value adds that we can provide um you know web web two VC funds don't really under, don't really understand the the um, the value of having a relationship with the exchanges, right? Like the, like like Huobi that David used to work at, um, you know, understanding the value of market makers, um, understanding you know how do you build a community uh, around Telegram? Some of them don't even know what Discord is. So I think there's 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 an edge, right? That yeah, that we have um, as Web three native funds, but I think. The, the VC funds in Menlo Park that are leaning in will eventually catch up. Um, so I think it's our you know, position to lose. So we just need to uh, stay one step ahead. 
Um, yeah, I think also another thing I did mention is that I used to work at a very large traditional VC fund as well. Um, was was left off in my bio. Um, so the fund I worked with for is uh, called Chiming Venture Partners. They they manage about nine billion globally. Um, and actually during my time there, um, I was helping them develop a crypto blockchain uh, thesis. But like within sort of their um, LPAs, um, they physically couldn't invest in the space at all, right? So I think not only did they not have the expertise to do so, but like within sort of their um, LPGP agreements, like they just were not able to, right? So I think it took them um, a couple of years to really amend some of their um, proceedings to you know, launch a new fund. And now um, actually they're, they're one of the more active funds investing in Web3 and crypto now, but I think, you know, a lot of this takes time, you know, because there's how big they are. They have to get a lot of their LPs who ultimately agree to invest in a new asset class that, you know, they're, they're taking a lot of risk, both um, from a regulatory perspective and also from a return perspective where they don't really know sort of, you know, how much upside there is other than like it's new and, you know, a lot of people are you know doing something in it. So I think now um, many, many funds are now well positioned or properly prepared from, I guess just a settled perspective to invest in a space. But I think as Ida mentioned earlier, a lot of them don't have the expertise or have the experience of really being a value add investor, right? I think you know, ultimately when you when Alan said like now capital is not as important as you know being able to be hands-on and being able to offer advice and connections and you know really being able to work very closely with the founder themselves. So a lot of that is very much lacking in the Web2 space. So even if they do have a crypto person, usually that crypto person is just now, you know, sort of getting into crypto or has just been inserted in the firm and that they don't really have a lot of sort of that dedicated experience that, that um, many of us have had for many years now. So it's definitely us, ours to lose, but I think as sort of venture capital really changes in the future, it's not even about, you know, Web2 VCs versus Web3 VCs. It's really about you know, what, how Web3 VCs like Edo's and mine stack up to like, you know, venture DAOs, right? Which is a new sort of subset of VCs where it's like, you know, a bunch of people pulling money together rather than, you know, investing from outside capital where it's like a centralized person managing and deciding, you know, where to invest the money. Now, essentially it's like, you know, um, the barrier of entry has become lower and lower that in that almost anyone can be a VC and almost anyone can sort of pull together money to be a VC. And like, um, I think that's sort of what I, I, I think what we're, we're really up against versus really, we're not really concerned about the Web2 VCs where I think, um, yeah, the whole paradigm shift of like investing is ultimately going to change in the future. Thanks, David. Um, I'm sure that many people in the audience at this point are wondering how they can get involved with Web3. Uh, many of them probably aren't software engineers by education or vacation. In fact, most of them probably don't write code in Solidity. Uh, they probably have graduate degrees in business. Uh, recognizing that, how would you recommend that members of the audience get involved with Web3? Um, Alan, perhaps you can give us your perspective on that. Uh, well, a good place to start would be just get, to get some, to get hands on, right? Get some personal experience, um, <clears throat> start buying, selling tokens on, on a decentralized exchange, right? Play around with some of the DeFi protocols out there, mint a couple of NFTs and uh, play some Web3 games, right? So that you you, you uh, get a, an intuitive feel for what the user experience is like for better or for worse. Um, we're still far, far from the kind of polished mobile user experience that that uh, users have gotten used to. and. And so that would be a, a great place to start. And then depending on the uh, the strengths that and skill sets that you bring to the table, you can then focus on you know, functional areas like marketing, community building, or perhaps if you have a legal background, focus on um, mitigating regulatory risks uh, and, and helping projects stay compliant with all the relevant regulations. Uh, there are a lot of actually non-engineering work that goes on that needs to happen uh, in, in order for a project to be successful, especially for an infrastructure project like Boba, where ecosystem building is is uh, just as important, if not more important than making sure the code works. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, folks with marketing, sales, business development experience that if they are able to successfully transition to Web3, that could find themselves to be very helpful to these projects. Thanks, Alan. Um, 
you know, when I spoke to you a few days ago, you mentioned that you had just come back from Singapore. Uh, David, you mentioned that you spend about a decade working in China. And Alan, when you said you raise capital, you said you raise capital from 400 plus investors all around the world. Um, some of the largest crypto exchanges and layer one blockchains were founded in China or by Chinese nationals. And one of the largest layer two scaling solutions, Polygon, was founded in India. The largest Bitcoin mining manufacturer is based in China. In addition, some other Asian countries such as Singapore have been very supportive of the crypto industry. So how do you think Asia and Asians will play a role in the development of Web3? I think like it very much already has, right? When you look at like every single token in the top 100 on, on CoinMarketCap, almost every single one of them has like a Asian like founder or like a co-founder or a senior executive within sort of the role. So I think, you know, very much, I think, as we think about companies nowadays, it's very much, very global, very international. There's people of all different backgrounds, but especially Asians, right? We've taken a huge, huge part of how the space panned out um, for what it is. And I think when you think about sort of the biggest face of the space, CZ, he's a very much a combination of a Canadian sort of born and raised uh, in combination with, you know, 10 plus experience working in China, right? So I think um, when you think about all the biggest layer one protocols, right? Like every single one of them has an Asian person, uh, you know, in within the founding team. So I think uh, that's very much part of the mindset that like Asia is by far probably the biggest addressable market when we think about, you know, retail adoption when it comes to, you know, tokens, uh, that are being traded and sort of the massive amounts of volumes that they in consolidation um, uh, are mass to be, but also like the biggest user base of users for Web3 gaming, Web3 social. I think already the paradigm shift from Web2, at least when it comes to like social gaming, a lot of the application layer projects already shifted the focus to Asia where, you know, a lot of the biggest companies come from there and have most of the majority of their user base there. But I think it's only a matter of time for Web3, where it's like a lot of sort of the application there is uh, coming out, you know, like hopefully with, you know, Ida and my help in helping them go to market in those um, jurisdictions is that they will be able to capture a lion's share of that market. And, you know, I think Asia in, in that stance is, you know, definitely more important than ever. All right. I'm, I'm going to say something that may be controversial, um, but you know, there are people out there that think that crypto is just a large online casino, right? For people to gamble and who likes gambling more than Asians. So I think that is, that's like the, the, the kind of a gateway, right? Of why I, I believe there's a bunch of um, Asians in, in the space. Um, but above and beyond that, right? That's a gateway, but it leads to um, a lot of smart people uh, building in the space um, and, and taking it to the next level, right? Uh, above and beyond the, the online casino analogy. Um, and for better, for worse, right? That brought a lot of Asians into the space. Um, hopefully they stay in the space, even in the bear market. Um, as David mentioned, a lot of them are, you know, heads of uh, and in charge of a lot of, um, you know, top projects like Alan. Um, so um, I do think that, you know, it's our um, kind of uh, spot to lose, right? Um, there are not a lot of, um, Asians, uh, you know, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies that are publicly listed on the NASDAQ or the, or the NY, NYSE, but there are a lot of um, Asians that are, that are CEOs and founders of publicly listed tokens. So um, hopefully that can trans, trans, uh, you know, trans, so translate over uh, to public equities, um, but I think this is a good uh, place for us to start. Thanks, Ida. Yeah, thanks, Ida and 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 David. Um, what what we've also uh, been observing is the the consumer adoption of crypto in Asia um, is actually uh, fairly high. Um, of course, it varies from country to country. Uh, East Asia is not one one unified uh, block, but um, especially when we start looking at the, some of the countries that are larger in population, but in terms of uh, GB, uh, GDP per capita uh, still uh, more uh, in the emerging economy uh, uh, category, crypto adoption is actually uh, growing very quickly. Um, for us, who, those who are living in the US, you know, we've, got, we've gotten very used to a very stable fiat currency, uh, traditional financial systems that work reasonably well. 
but uh, unfortunately, that's not the case around the world in a, in a lot of places. And um, uh, the more imperfect the, uh, the status quo is, the more likely the population will jump to crypto. Uh, I was just speaking with um, uh, someone I met at a conference yesterday. They're like, they, they prefer to hold um, USDC instead of their own country's fiat currency as as part as part of their uh, own portfolio, right? It's just more stable. Uh, it's, a, it's a roundabout way to hold US dollars, but much more convenient. Thanks, Alan. Um, this has been a phenomenal discussion. Has highlighted many important issues for Web3. Um, I'd love to continue this discussion with the three for another hour or maybe even two, but I'd also like to leave some questions, some time for the audience to ask some questions. Uh, Chris, I'm going to hand it over to you now to lead the Q&A session for questions from the audience. Yeah, we have a few more minutes left in this session. So let me just go through the chat box. Um, there's a question here about uh, policy, fragmented policy, regulatory, legal environment that the crypto world is in right now. Do you guys have any thoughts on that, on, on how as you run your funds or run your company, how you mitigate any potential downside that uh, earns some regulatory um, rules that may come into play. How do you, how do you think about that? Uh, maybe Alan? Wants to yeah, I'll that. jump in with a couple of thoughts. Um, uh, one, um, in so uh, one of the challenges uh, for policymakers is they, they are not, uh, they don't really understand the technology because it's not what they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And that, that knowledge gap makes it difficult for them to, um, uh, to craft uh, really thoughtful policies around disruptive technologies like Web3, crypto, blockchain. Um, and so in, over the years, uh, industry efforts have emerged to help educate uh, law, uh, policymakers. And you know, some headways are being made, but we're, it's, it's a long journey. Uh, uh, groups like the Blockchain Association has done a great job in the U.S. Uh, Andrew Yang has started uh, Lobby3, which is a bipartisan group that is very pro-crypto, uh, trying to educate uh, policymakers in how to craft uh, regulations that promote the benefits of crypto while uh, offering consumer protection. And um, in the U.S. situation, is is actually quite different than most other countries in uh, in our experience. In many other countries, there's a single regulator uh, that's responsible for regulating digital assets, whereas in, in the U.S., uh, we have a more decentralized or fragmented regulatory regime, and that has led to a lot of ambiguity. Um, and uh, for um, builders like ours that that are building web3 projects in the us uh, we work with um, we have to make sure we work with really knowledgeable uh, law firms uh, legal counsel to advise us in in making sure that we stay in uh, in compliance where like for example Anya labs is a us company um, whereas boba network is a decentralized project we are a core contributor to it we actually work with two different law firms as our legal counsel so we always get a second opinion to uh, make sure we are uh, being thoughtful about uh, our decisions and what we say and how we communicate thank you alan Ida or david yeah i think like with regards to like present day um most people still look towards the us as to look for the most up-to-date sort of regulatory frameworks and policies that, you know, hold compliance at the highest standards for cryptocurrency and Web3 and beyond. Um, but, you know, a lot of obviously the ensuing jurisdictions and emerging countries still matter, but a lot of they very much take upon the U.S. stance. But I think at the end of the day, most of these regulations are fairly archaic. Like, you know, regulation can never catch up to innovation, right? So I think the space is always going to be moving faster than how quickly this, the government is going to be regulating things. Um, but when all is said and done, right, a lot of these rules in the U.S. government are just written by a bunch of dudes that came in the 1700s and like those rules last until today. I think ultimately when more and more people spend in the digital world and we're a very digital first economy and everyone ultimately interacts and um, so sort of the society is created within the metaverse is that like this is the best chance that we'll have and resetting sort of some of the global policies in the world. And that's really, that comes with sort of the, the early movers on, you know, who's ultimately going to be the early sort of developers and early participants of, you know, what's soon to be the metaversal world, right? And like a lot of the policies then will be very modern, right? And, you know, that will sort of govern sort of the next, you know, couple of decades and beyond with regards to how sort of 
the digital world will be governed in a compliant uh, and regulatory way, you know, before you know, some of us go to Mars or something. Thoughts on refi, regenerative finance. Um, we didn't talk about that uh, today. Any thoughts on that? Sure. So um, we actually are pretty bull bullish on refi. Um, we've made a couple of investments, including ClimaDAO, uh, a company called Open Forest Protocol. Um, I think this is a, a very interesting space um, because it's fraught with a couple of things um, that blockchain can solve. Uh, for example, in the carbon markets, uh, you have issues around transparency and governance. Transparency, who knows what a carbon credit is worth, right? It's, it's very opaque on, the, on that point. And then governance, who decides on what is a legitimate carbon credit? A couple of companies like Vera, Gold Standard, um, oligopolies. So um, with blockchain, you can solve the transparency issue, putting carbon credits on chain, originating them um, on chain. Um, uh, the company I mentioned, Open Forest Protocols, is working on that, um, minting carbon credits directly from the source of the project, forest, mangrove, whatever it is. Um, and then governance, um, being able to validate those projects, those carbon credits, uh, using um, a decentralized uh, validation network um, is much better than um, depending on uh, centralized entities like Vera um, and, and can lead to more of the profits um, that are right now taken by these middlemen. Uh, more of those profits can be distributed to project owners um, and, re and, and uh, refi projects uh, and to uh, the validators. So I think uh, this is definitely a space that um, is getting more and more uh, uh, interest. Um, and I think for the right reasons uh, to solve some of the greenwashing issues, some of the um, transparency governance issues that exist today in this space. Great, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll jump to the next question. Um, we talked about a little bit of this, actually perhaps a lot, but just to reemphasize, um, there are a lot of budding entrepreneurs in the audience, uh, as well as budding investors. Um, if you if you were to if they were to have five minutes of your time um, after this session, what advice would you give them, both from an entrepreneur perspective as well as an investor perspective, if they wanted to start uh, a new business? Maybe Alan. Yeah, I would say in addition to getting first-hand experience, like I said before, um, um, as both Ida and David pointed to, the space is so new and at the same time so fast moving. Make sure you spend a lot of time just immersing yourself uh, in uh, crypto Twitter, uh, Discord conversations. Um, and so you combine that firsthand user experience with um, a, a sense of what the culture is like uh, around different projects, around crypto in general, Web3, how DAOs function, how do people vote on proposals, why do some proposals get passed and others don't, and why why do some groups become delegates, like all of these it, uh, cultural and political uh, phenomena that are most more uh, uh, specific to Web3 are foreign to those who are outside the world. So make sure you spend some time uh, immersing yourself into this environment, but it won't take long because if you're passionate about the space, this is going to become addictive and you soon find yourself staying up all night trying to catch up on the latest development. Thank you, Alan. Ida or David? Yeah, I think like... Um... Starting a VC nowadays is like almost zero barrier to entry, right? So I think before starting your own VC or before you start to invest, I think you really have to think about, you know, what is your competitive advantage, right? Even so for me, like what I thought was competitive advantage, you know, when I first started in 2021, being one of the first to come out from a major uh, exchange to launch their own fund. Now there's like 20 people just like me, right? Um, being almost, I think to, uh, today, um, the first to come from sort of the Asia, China background and be situated in the U.S. markets and really understanding a lot about sort of that space and being able to help some of the Western entrepreneurs there um, to be able to go to market in Asia. Um, I was the first to do that, but now there's also like, you know, 20, 30 people that are doing that as well. So I think, you know, making sure that like a lot of sort of what you're doing now um, is a true competitive advantage and something that's very much needed in the space and you know, being able to be appreciated by uh, a lot of founders out there um, before just you know, raising a bunch of money and, and starting a VC because that's not gonna be competitive in the long run when 
you're not able to, you know, fit yourself into some of the very competitive rounds in these projects where they're looking for very distinctive and, you know, very differentiated value add from each investor. Gita, final thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, okay, so right now we are in a bear market. Uh, people have more time. So I think if you're interested in the space, um, you know, you can reach out to founders on Twitter, DM them. Uh, different types of projects, you know, they'll have more time to talk to you. Um, and, you know, you'll be surprised, right? This community is is actually very um, giving, um, especially in the bear market, you know, where people aren't, you know, on their screens trading all day. Um, so I think um, this is a perfect time to, um, you know, just talk to talk to folks who are building in the space um, and, and really figure out what within these, this space, which verticals are you most interested in uh, to build, um, if you want to do more on the investment side of things, um, this is also a really good time to uh, talk to talk to different founders to see how you can help out, uh, roll up your sleeves to uh, add value. Um, so it's a, it's a perfect time, much better than in a bull market where you know everybody is you know laser focused on 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 their projects. And uh, I think this is a really good time to get into the space for sure. Thank you. Yuda. Well, I think our our time is coming to an end. I want to thank. Alan, Yida, David, uh, for participating in the GSB Asian Alumni Chapter on Web3. Really appreciate your, your honest and frank uh, thoughts on this industry and the opportunities and challenges. Um, I want to also thank Goggin for being the event organizer, coming up with the idea for this event and executing it to perfection. Thank you, Goggin, very much. Um, Thank you everyone for participating. Um, this is one of uh, several events that we have uh, planned for the future, for the near future. Uh, very shortly, we'll be sharing more information about our um, in-person uh, summit, USB Asian Alumni Chapter Summit in February of 2023 on the campus of Stanford Business School. That'll be very exciting for us. So as that information becomes available, we'll share that with our community. That brings this session to a close. Um, thank you everyone for coming.